My question is, how effective are workout drinks and gels in fueling a workout, especially if pre-ride eating has not been optimal or the workout is in a fasted state? I'm not trying to lose weight or optimize fat utilization, but to fuel to optimize my workouts. So I use the 60 to 90 grams of carbs as an hour or an hour as a personal guide for my in-workout fueling strategy, taking about 30 grams as I'm warming up, then spreading throughout the remainder of the workout. I ask these following questions because I want to fuel well, but I also do not want to un unnecessarily use expensive products. And thanks for your feedback. So I guess question one, what is the difference between fueling ahead of time through whole foods and fueling on the bike for a one to two hour workout? Cool. And we'll get to that in just one second. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. First off, I want to say your approach already is pretty <coughs> solid. So you're on a real good path. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, we're going to call this question zero. You said how effective are workout drinks and gels in fueling a workout? they're exceptionally effective. That's oh, what yeah. they're designed to do. Mm -hmm. So there are not too many better ways to go, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Okay. With that in mind, I'm back to the question, uh, feeling before ahead of time with whole foods, feeling on the bike with, uh, you know, sure workout specific food or race specific food, performance that's a, food, let's say that's a really good, sorry. Can I just hopefully to like draw more relation to this for people that are listening to this. Sometimes I have this situation where I'm out at lunch and then I think, Ooh, I could order that. And that would be pretty heavy food or pretty heavy on the carbs, more energy. Yep. Uh, but then what do I do in terms of fueling on the bike? Should I just skip fueling on the bike since I have more on board coming in vice versa? It's a question that I think most of us wrestle with this sort of thing. Frequently, all the time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of moving parts here too. Right. Um, so, First off, my personal disclaimer is much of what we're about, what, what I'm about to recommend are for performance, not nutrition. Mm -hmm. So this is, they're, they're two different things. A lot of the times they align, some of the times they don't. So we're moving forward with simply the goal of the best performance possible during workouts, races, and events, mm -hmm. lumped all those together. Cool. Okay. So um, the whether it's pre-nutrition, pre-workout nutrition or intra-workout nutri nutrition, they have a shared objective and it's simply sufficient glycogen in your liver and of course your muscles. Mm -hmm. That's really all we're after. Um, so uh, I talked about the gels and drinks are perfectly effective, often, often optimized to be exactly what he's describing he needs. Mm -hmm. um, so back to that question one, the biggest difference is the healthfulness, healthfulness of the food. Mm -hmm. So the benefits of fueling ahead of time, also known as just eating meals, we're just talking about regular meals, um, is that there's a greater potential for fuller glycogen repletion. So it's a lot easier to fully stock your glycogen stores if you're eating well in advance of your event and you're incrementally nourishing them. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about um, glycogen replenishment rates in a little bit. Um, there's also a lower likelihood of GI distress. You know, you're not cramming a bunch of food in, rather you're getting it incrementally in a normal way, the way that you're probably used to. Uh, there's an opportunity for carbohydrate loading when you do it well in advance. You can't carbohydrate load immediately before an event. It's simply impossible, which mm -hmm. it takes you know, literally days or at least a day prior. Um, <clears throat> you can eat whole foods or regular meals, just like I mentioned, to accomplish this, this loading, this glycogen loading. And that means that there's a higher, often much higher nutritional content. Mm -hmm. So you can actually focus on nutrition, not simply fueling. Yeah. Yeah. So, but when it comes to just pre-workout fueling, um, the necessity just prior really revolves around time constraints. So maybe it's pre-workout, maybe you're just rolling out of bed, maybe it's pre-race, you know, the morning of an event. Um, but in any case, there are a lot of situations where you, you're not optimally fueled coming into a workout or, or an event. Mm -hmm. So most commonly it's just early morning, you're straight out of bed after an overnight fast or for whatever reason, over the course of the day, you missed your meal. So now your, your, your workouts at four o'clock and you skip lunch. What do you do? It even happens to me. Like when I have planned to train at a specific time in the afternoon and then the day gets busy. Absolutely. So then I, you know, spend All one time. to two extra hours. And as a result, it's I'm further away from that eating window, yep. you know? So, so when you have to eat in this narrow pre-workout window, um, the F emphasis with your nutrition shifts toward the rate of absorption. What you're concerned with is how quickly you're going to get it into your system. So the narrower that window, the more digestible your food needs to be, more rapidly absorbed. Mm -hmm. um, so we talk about digest digestible, um, which is basically food in the mouth, into the stomach, into the gut, into the blood, actually reaches the muscles so you feel that nutrition doing its job. Mm -hmm. um, a better term actually would be absorption because digestion really takes place in the stomach. It's absorption in the small intestine that we're concerned with. We need it in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Um, the narrower the time frames, the the more important that rate of absorption gets. <clears throat> and and while some of this is subjective, we're going to speak in generalities here. Typically, foods absorb this quickly. 
doesn't you know across people it, there's probably some wiggle room i'm sure there's some wiggle room there anything nutritionally related always has a certain <laughs> level of subjectivity we know this yep always does but in terms of and i'll go through all three macronutrients um with heavy emphasis on carbohydrates that's really what we're talking about here mm -hmm. um the simpler the faster the, the more quickly it it becomes absorb or absorbs and goes to work but this assumes <clears throat> that whatever form of car carbohydrate you're taking in it's unaccompanied pretty much Okay, obviously you can drink water, but if you're gonna pair it with fat or protein or uh, longer chain carbohydrates, more complex carbohydrates, these, these rates of absorption are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. So the quickest stuff is, is all your monosaccharides. There's only three of them. It's glucose, fructose, and galactose. And fructose is just what a fructose, or I'm sorry, fructose is basically sugar glucose, mm -hmm. whereas uh, galactose is milk glucose, right? Best pair, name ever, pair, by pair the way. galactose with glucose and you get lactose. <laughs> Sounds like a villain. It's yeah. lactose. It's Space a, sugar. That's what it is. Those are, all, those are all super quick. So if you think in terms of something like glucose tablets that you know diabetics use, mm -hmm. but athletes also use as well, those can take effect. You can start to feel the effects super quick, three to five minutes, and, and you're already starting to feel it. 10 to five minutes, or I'm sorry, 10 to 15 minutes, and your blood sugar will start to stabilize. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Stacey Sims, I saw her recommend this like a year ago on a podcast, yeah. and I bought some. You can get them at like a local drugstore on Amazon. I have them mm -hmm. sitting right next to me. Yep, I have them on my, I don't use them all the time, but I keep <laughs> them on my table. And if I get into a low glycemic state, like you can feel it when oh, you're yeah. kind of crashing. It's very uh -huh. evident. I pop like three of those. And then you're right, right five minutes, you start to come back and I still drink stuff and I'm like, oh, let's get back on. Mm -hmm. And it has saved workouts. Oh yeah. And they're so cheap. They're like $3 a bottle. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just five grams per tablet. So you pop three of those, you get 15 grams. That's the whole diabetic 15 and 15, right? You pop mm -hmm. 15 grams of sugar, you wait 15 minutes. If your blood glucose hasn't stabilized, you're not feeling good. You do another 15, wait another 15 minutes. Same idea applies here. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, so, interesting. <clears throat> and then we get slightly more complex with carbohydrate. We're talking about what we normally see in, in sports drinks. And this is dextrose, which is what, just wheat, wheat glucose? Uh -huh. it? No, it's corn, corn glucose. Maltodextrin, which is just uh, multiple chains, so it's more dense glucose. Uh -huh. And then sucrose, which is just a combination, a one-to-one -one combination of fructose and glucose. Uh -huh. And that one-to-one -one will... Uh, um, we're going to talk more on that in a minute. Um, but in any case, this is more of like a, a 10 to 15 minute absorption rate. You, uh -huh. You'll start to feel the benefit of ingesting these things in about 10 to 15 minutes. Which means that when it comes to pre-workout, you don't want to time this outside of probably that 15 minute window any more than that. And you risk what's called rebound hypoglycemia where your insulin spikes and blood sugar is absorbed and you go into a workout feeling lower than low or a race. And I've done that a number of times. Yes, uh -huh. this is this sure. happened to me for years and I never knew. Like I would do sports drinks for an hour leading up to the race uh -huh. and then you'd start the race and I'd be on the swim it's and awful. triathlon and I'd you know, be shaky. shaky. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Dizzy. I, I think I heard too this because like it affects different parts of the population different. Like some people have this happen to them, some people don't. Probably. I definitely have this happen to me, and it's it, it can ruin a race and a workout. Mm -hmm. You think oh, I'm just gonna sip it all the whole time, but no, like just right before or 15 minutes or less before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah, like nothing between three hours before. Like just don't eat anything. Really under 30 minutes, uh, and and this is probably subjective too. But if it's less then 30 minutes, you're probably safe. But this, as with anything, you want to experiment with it and find yeah. out how it affects you personally. Yep, Easy to practice individual. in training. Totally. totally. That's totally. the yeah. nice part about having a structured plan is that you have a workout that you can count on every day. It's also controlled or you know what sort of work you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful yep. in that regard. Okay, so that's sports drinks, 10 to 15 minutes. Gel's pretty much the same timeline. You just have to ingest them with a large bowl of water. As long as you can't just put a bunch of dense carbohydrate on your gut and expect not to f face any consequences from that absorption rate will be slowed. It'll probably cause a bit of dehydration because it's going to pull water from elsewhere. So make sure you ingest it with uh, a couple, couple few ounces of water. Uh -huh. Um, so next in terms of carb carbohydrate complexity is fruits and vegetables. And people do fuel with these and they do eat them pre, pre, uh, workout or pre race. Um, mm -hmm. that's more on the order of 20 to 40 minutes for mm -hmm. absorption depends really on the, the amount of fiber. It depends on a few things, but fiber is, is a large factor. So you think of something like watermelon that's got very little fiber in it, 20 minutes, you'll probably start to feel it, as opposed to something like an apple, which is very fibrous, probably more along the lines of 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, then, of course, you have to consider the impact of fiber, too, because fiber slows digestion. It can also affect your stool composition. So, I mm -hmm. mean, you eat a bunch of fiber, um, and, and this is a little more important when you consider the duration of the event, 60 minute criterion versus, you know, eight hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours on an Ironman course, 15 mm -hmm. hours, 
bit different and a bit different. And I'm sure we've all seen the photo of the, the marathon runner who <laughs> yeah, shorts is a porta potty. It's, yeah. it's grisly, but yeah. it tells you this is, this is a, a real consideration. Yeah. Um, and there's also fructose considerations. So along the lines of fruit, the liver has to process glucose, right? And this limits the rate of absorption. Seems like that rate of absorption is pegged around five to 50 grams. That's a tenfold difference, which is a big difference, which tells you it's something that's not only subjective, but it's also trainable. Mm. The more fructose you eat, the more of a particular transporter you, that becomes present or produced, the more you can absorb. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's interesting about that also is that if you combine it with glucose, it ups that absorption rate. Interesting. Yeah. So this is why a little later on, I'm going to talk about that glucose fructose ratio, because there's some new findings that are absolutely very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, some fruits contain fructose, some don't. So just don't assume because you're eating fruit that there's automatically fructose. And that it's uh, it's not like 100% of it is I'm fructose. Sorry, sucrose, sucrose. Um, yeah. yeah, like that's, I always, before I was like, oh, it's, it's fruit toast. So <laughs> yeah, this should all be that, though. right? But it's not. Sometimes it's like 50%, sometimes it's less. And <laughs> said sometimes yeah, so not. fructose, I'm pretty sure is always there. It's sucrose that is in some fruits and not other fruits. Mm -hmm. So let me be clear on that. Mm -hmm. I misstated that. Um, and then uh, a little a little on down the line, potatoes and sweet potatoes. And these are vegetables. They're, they're root vegetables. We're looking more along the lines of an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then fruit juices and uh, fruit smoothies. So fruit juices are fiber free. So, so that's going to get into the system quite a lot quicker than something with fiber, which is a smoothie because you're just blending the entire fruit. So, you know, fiber free, maybe 15, 20 minutes with fiber, 20 to 30 minutes, still mm -hmm. pretty quick, but there is the impact of fiber to be considered. Mm -hmm. And then finally, in terms of carbohydrate, a carbohydrate way up on the complexity range, we got whole grains and beans and you're looking at a couple hours there. And mm -hmm. this is typically why we say it eat at least two hours out, preferably more like three hours out. If you plan to consume complex carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a good rundown right there. That is a good rundown. Thanks, yeah, Chad. I learned That's a lot awesome. over these yeah. last few days. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And then proteins and fats, I'm going to touch on these because it's pretty evident that they do not metabolize quickly. So this mm -hmm. has to be eaten, you know, days before or at least hours before. In the case of seeds and nuts, a couple, three hours. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of dairy, we're looking at anywhere from 90 minutes to five hours. And that Holy depends <clears throat> on a couple things. <laughs> First is the fat content. Skim milk is obviously going to process a lot quicker than whole milk. Mm -hmm. Um and then the, the far end of that spectrum would be hard cheese. So we're talking really dense fat, right? And then the proteins in, <clears throat> excuse me, the proteins in milk are casein and whey, mm -hmm. two ends of the spectrum. Whey, if you take it alone and you do it in a reasonably sized dose, that can be in your system inside of an hour. Whereas casein can take up to seven hours to fully digest. Mm -hmm. And this is why strength athletes will you know, have a casein shake before they go to bed at night, because mm -hmm. it's really slow releasing. <clears throat> Interesting. And then meat and eggs, we'll just pair those together, couple to five hours. Um, you know, the leaner it is, the more quickly it's going to digest, the fattier it is. So I think something like pork, it's going to take a heck of a lot longer than a chicken breast. Oh. So you mentioned this before, but so if I have fat, like uh, seeds and nuts yeah. with white rice, it's going to slow, slow down the absorption, absorption of, of the white rice. Yeah, yeah. So if you have peanut sauce on your white rice, yep. you're like, oh. It's not all independent. It doesn't like go into like different avenues within your body and then they all operate yeah, independently. It affects our it's absorption affecting. rate. Yeah. They're, it's, not, it's simply not going <clears> to <throat> absorb as quickly. It'll yeah. still absorb, mm -hmm. but and the fat's going to absorb more slowly. So you're going to be carrying that around the whole time, which can be pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah so, so basically any, any proteins and fats that are going to be ingest, ingested have to be done with plenty of time prior to your workout. Yeah. Yeah. And then just a few considerations. <clears throat> Sorry, that's annoying. Um, that's the time of year. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> uh, meal size impacts, impacts your digestion rate and therefore your absorption rate. Mm -hmm. So big meal prior to a workout, it's going to take even longer to absorb. Probably not a good idea on a few levels. Hydration affects your rate of gastric emptying. So if you're dehydrated, it's going to slow it down. I have some actual statistics to share on that a little later. That's uh, sorry. Drive one, that home. one thing on that, that's why it's so you get into that spiral where you become dehydrated and then you don't feel like eating. And then even if you do eat, it's not like yeah. it's going to be optimal uptake of that at a, food. At a point, you might as well not eat at all. It's, it's so, oh, it's so rough, right? Yep. That's why it's so important to keep up on it. Mm -hmm. And the, the intensity of the work you're doing obviously dictates your food selection. Um, it also dictates the concentration. So if you overdo it on your carbo fluid with too high a concentration and you're working at a really high intensity, that can definitely lead to some gastrointestinal distress. And like, I, well, like we've talked about a few times already mm -hmm. is that food combinations can alter that absorption rate. So you're not going to put peanut sauce on your rice if you want the, the benefit of the rice, the, you know, the glycemic uptick to, to happen quickly. Uh -huh. 
Um, and then personal tolerance levels, obviously, are highly objective. So you have to practice, practice, practice. Lots of trial and error. You have to train your gut. And you have to learn, you know, what you what you can tolerate. What you can tolerate right now might be different than what you can tolerate after several months of ingesting a particular food because you're dead set on making this work. You've recognized it worked in the past. Maybe it's not working now. But once you refamiliarize, rehabituate to this uh -huh. higher intake, your gut can do wondrous things. I've, I've noticed that personally. <clears throat> I've, I've completely evolved in terms of what I can eat on the bike and how much I can take in mm -hmm. and everything else. Nate's looking at me like a proud papa right now. Yeah, and you, <laughs> you have to note all this stuff. I mean, write it yeah. down. Start to learn. You can, you can get really, really specific with your nutritional. I mean, Nate does a spreadsheet for his races. Mm -hmm. I, I used to scoff at that. And then, you know, he finishes these races and I cramp severely six right. hours into a seven-hour ride. Right. Yeah, it, so, there's something to it. Credit where credit is due. The, the notes part is super important like it's because it's easy to skew it in perspective and also if you have a plan going through it makes it really easy uh, this is kind of an aside but the psychological stress that you can have on your mind of wondering if you've <clears throat> eaten enough or not because it's basically wondering if your race is going to fall apart or not that's mm -hmm. a lot that 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 absolutely affects your yeah, performance and with longer events those risks you just can't take um yeah. i'm not going to take credit for this necessarily it's because i started as a triathlete yeah and in triathlon culture this is the norm. It's like talking about tire pressure or shock pressure. Yeah. Like everyone talks about it the totally. whole time. Um, and yeah. Jonathan, think about how much of your career and stuff you limited yourself for performance oh, yeah. because you thought I have a fussy stomach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Think of like nationals. You totally done better. Like in the build up to nationals. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Crazy, right? And it's just because you know, basically, I hadn't really been diligent in going through the process of figuring out exactly what worked and what didn't work, and then how to take it in and at what rates. It's, yeah. it, what, in triathlon, you, you consider it like you know, you have swim, bike, and run, and then eating. They, it's, it's its own event, its own yes. thing that you have to, like you yep. said, train and and concentrate on and try to improve. And, yeah. and it's amazing. Like I know that like road cyclists love to scoff at triathletes, but they would learn so much and get so much faster if they would at the very least just adopt this portion of what they do really well yeah. on the nutrition it's side. Triathletes, it's because they want speed first and style and caring what people think about it is second. And whereas road is, is yeah. many times flipped. That's why they started with the aero helmet and uh, aero bars, right? Yeah. Mm. People scoffed at those at first. Yeah. yeah. And now everyone has it. And there's so many things yeah. that start in tri world and then get into yeah. road triathletes stuff. by and large have their nutrition dialed. Again, it was something I, I never wanted to think that hard. So I, that's the reason I scoffed at it, not because I didn't, because I thought it didn't work, simply yeah. because I didn't want to think that hard. Yeah. But the fact is, if you're going to do an event that takes yeah. five to 15 hours, you need to think that hard. Yeah, you absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, a couple other minor considerations on this question before we move on to the other ones, which I <coughs> promise the replies are much shorter. Um, when eating is restricted to just prior to the workout or event, the duration and the intensity of the workout can absolutely uh, affect your intra workout nutrition. Yeah. So totally. if, if you, you, know, you get up in the morning, you have a small pre workout meal, but you're doing a three hour ride, obviously you're going to have to fuel in the midst of that ride as well. That, mm -hmm. that small meal is not going to carry you. Probably not, mm -hmm. um, especially if the intensity is up there. And then when eating well in advance of a workout or event, can consider the meal size and what the meal was relative to that time gap because you can burn off all that fuel by the time you actually get to your workout and again, be underfueled. Yeah. In experimentation, I've found that for me, it's around two and a half to three hours. I basically, after that Depending point, on what you eat. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, typically like, you know, pre-race, that sort of stuff. It's something that's free of a lot of fat. Um, you know, there's, it's hard to go fat free on everything. Just there's fat and everything basically, but, uh, keep some it low, though. rice. And then with rice, I'll have something else with, you know, some, some vegetables that aren't too high in fiber, that sort of a thing. And then not a lot of protein. And that's what I'll use. That's what I'll try to take in. And I've noticed that for me, it's around two and a half to three hours. Nate, uh, what's your like kind of time window that you have for a morning race? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Before yeah. the race. Uh, so before the race, three hours and, uh, multi meal cream and wheat or, uh, wheat farina. I think mm -hmm. that's how you say it, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, it's like processed wheat. There's no fiber in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like super that's easy. Big deal. I make it with water uh -huh. and then I add a little bit of almond milk and I put salt in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what I've read for research, uh, when I load for like these big races, I try to aim for 400 grams, mm -hmm. which I've never done because that is so much. So um, I even tried to before uh, Sea Otter, I did too much of it and yeah. I threw up. Yeah. Um, so I don't think I'm ever going to hit that 400, but I can hit 200 pretty easily. Or, and then I might have a banana or something with it to try to get a little bit more in, or some juice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the that's it's easy. You can put it in your suitcase. You can mm -hmm. make it pretty much anywhere. All you need is a, a mm -hmm. microwave or... Uh, yeah. 
stove pre for my pre-race meal that's like so the one that i described is like my everyday lunch sort of thing before training oh for pre-race i always go with cream of wheat and the the best part about cream of wheat at least for me is that i can just take hot water from like a coffee maker in the hotel room sort of a thing if i'm traveling yeah, yeah. just heat up the water in there then after that put it into the cup and then i have cream of wheat can you make some of those things work with just hot tap water yeah have you, you ever can done that? Yeah. yeah it's it. it can be tough but yeah especially if you go with like the instant oats sort of a thing yeah. like uh, it may not be as high quality but i've found that i've gone with like just really hot water and from a from a, sh a, a hotel bathroom and i've been able to get if it you're desperate i guess that's your only i've yeah. done yeah. a little like jet boil camper stove thing oh yeah, yeah. we smart. boil that too it's a good idea smart. it's probably not to do in a hotel room but <laughs> <laughs> do it in the parking lot yeah if everything's fine everything's fine right <laughs> yeah no i not uh cool so question, question two. two go ahead yeah is is there a difference in carb quality between whole foods and on the bike gels and drinks when taking gels and drinks on the bike how long does it take for them to begin to actually provide usable food for the body so we've uh kind of so covered we, some we of that basically covered that um let me just say that there's a huge difference but nutrition is <laughs> not the objective here fueling is so mm -hmm. you got to look at it through through that lens. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just recap fastest to slowest. Yep. Something like glucose tablets, super fast, but the carbohydrate content's low. So it's not a realistic race fuel. It's a, it's a desperation maneuver, really. Mm -hmm. um, drinks and gels, 10 to 15 minutes. And then solid foods, 20 minutes to several hours. Yep. Question three, is there an optimal strategy for spacing or taking <clears throat> the gels, i.e. front load without causing stomach uh, discomfort or spread throughout evenly. Absolutely. Um, fueling objectives are, are really threefold. You want to avoid the wrong foods. You want to avoid too high concentrations of proper foods, and you want to avoid too long periods between your nutrient intake. Mm -hmm. Come, that, that's it. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're spacing meals over the course of a, of uh, of a day, it also depends whether you're coming in. <clears throat> it will affect whether you're coming into your workout low versus topped off. Yeah. And if you slam it all at the last minute probably going to be a little bit glycogen depleted as opposed to doing it properly over the course of a day and doing it with the right foods, recognizing what your objectives are. You can come in topped off. Cause that's going to allow enough time for absorption. And yes. Absorption and, and this else. becomes a concern of glycogen synthesis, right? Something I've wanted to talk about for a long time. Um, yeah, <clears throat> this obviously changes relative to, to, to your workout proximity. So it's, Something that has to be considered well in advance of something like Leadville mm -hmm. or, or an Ironman. Um, and the rate of glycogen synthesis actually slows as your, as your muscle glycogen stocks up. So it's not a constant thing. It doesn't just synthesize at this rate, give it this much. It's as it tops off, that rate of absorption gets slower and slower. So you have to affect your intake accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, rates, it, it, this seems to be pretty widely accepted, is anywhere from 0.8 to 1.2 grams a kilogram that's that's about all the faster your your muscles can absorb glycogen or synthesize glycogen out of the in incoming glucose and that translates to about 0.4 to 0.6 grams per pound yeah so that's it's always not, a helpful way to look it's at. not quick but th those are statistics that are useful if you're trying to carbo load or even if you're trying to just make you have make sure you have you know the, the four or five hundred grams mm -hmm. of glycogen that you know your body can store on hand when needed. Right. Um, spacing of carbohydrate fluid and carbohydrate gels during workouts or events. Uh, the, the rate of absorption in your gastrointestinal system relates to, to the intensity. Mm -hmm. So the higher the intensity, the more simple those carbohydrates have to be. It's really that simple. And that's why most athletes who are working at a fair clip simply drink carbo fluid. Maybe, yeah. maybe hit a gel every once in a while. With like a cross country Olympic sort of uh, stuff, uh, criteriums, that sort of stuff. I, I can sneak in a gel sometimes, Yeah, but, but even then, it's you tough. Guys, you got to pound it with a bunch of water. Your mouth's probably already dry to start with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a bottle or nothing for this And the bar's hard. And, oh, oh, yeah. 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 I, yeah, I would consider it. Right. Uh, the thing that I do, and I don't know if this is their science behind this, Chad, but it, so if we're doing, I just did uh, three by 20 minutes at Sweet Spot yesterday. As soon as I end an interval and you have like a five or seven minute rest, mm -hmm. I down that gel within the first like. I reach for it exactly after the end of the interval. Sounds like a great idea. Because then I have more time to absorb it and it's just easier on me. The, the competition for digestion isn't as fierce as it is when you're working really exactly. hard. And then yeah. when you're in the middle of an interval and you do it, like you see your heart rate jack up, your breathing changes because you don't breathe for a second. And yeah. it's, like in those hard oh, yeah. intervals, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing for races is um, you do a big climb and I know I'm going to descend for a while on especially mountain biking, if you can't descend, a lot of times when I'm descending, I can't eat because I'm, I have to have both hands on and I'm scared yep. for my life. Yep. Um, but when you crest the hill, 
you, f- you don't want to do it, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to do. That's the time. Like, I'm going to slam two gels right now. And maybe that's not optimal, but that's better than one and not having it all during the descent. If 100%. you know you can tolerate it and you yeah. know you can. I can. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it at all. Yeah. Yeah. Or you slam a bottle like it's, it's right at the top. Tops of climbs for mountain bikers. They know that at the top of the climb, that's when you take in fuel. And if you watch, so uh, if you watch, uh, feed zones aside, right? Because everyone all, all, always drinks in the feed zone, that sort of a thing, and they move on. But if you watch the onboard nutrition that they're carrying on their bike, like the bottle, in almost every case, they're going to drink that at the top of the climb. Mm-hmm. And it's because that way they're going to have a descent and they'll be able to take care of Anytime it. Anytime they're doing it on the way off, way up, it's it's the end of the race or they've made a bad mistake and they're in yep. a bad spot exactly yes yeah it's a, actually another pro tip is just seeing when your competition's drinking when they're going up like a really intense sort of thing attack them probably in yeah. a bad way like, well, like it's the time to go and only if it's intense right if it's uh-huh. a uh if you're doing like a yeah. gravel no, race sure you can That's eat the different. whole time space it out yep. like mm-hmm. leadville space it out yep yeah, but I would still deal. eat before I descended Columbine because I'm not taking my hands off the handlebar. Yeah, yeah. sure, like, that's another consideration. And that's like too. a 20 or 30 minute descent, I think. And that's a really good consideration over over something as long as Leadville. You miss a 30 minute window, a 30 minute nourishment window, that mm-hmm. can definitely impact the the last couple oh, hours. And you're not of your doing ride. much, so your stomach's yeah. like it's more likely to absorb than when I'm pedaling. So no, even more reason to absolutely. Have one. I actually remember exactly what I did on Columbine this year. <clears throat> so going up, I didn't. I hardly drank anything going up because it's. It's not that it's crazy intense, but that's one of the harder points of the race. So I didn't drink a whole lot other than I had some water and some carbohydrate drink. I was just drinking Mar 10 320. And I had that, um, I didn't bring a camel back on that section because I didn't want to have the extra weight Mm -hmm. going on that. Right. So I got to the top, I kind of saved my bottle that I had, and then I had another bottle in my Jersey and then I had all the gels. Once I got to where in, for those that don't know the course, it gets to a point where it kind of flattens out toward the top, but you still keep going for a little bit. I don't know if you remember this, Nate. It was um, all extremely <laughs> steep. Yeah. Yeah. So it kind of gets to a point where it kind of flattens out ish and then you get to the turnaround. And by the time I actually, so got to the top there, I took in two gels at the top and then, and there were the Martin gels that I had. Then once I started descending and got past all the craziness and got to the fire road, I drank my entire bottle and then I, drank, I ate another gel. So I had known from previous experience in training my body that I could take in a lot of carbohydrate in one moment, mm-hmm. right? Like I could take it in, my body can process it as long as I'm not sprinting and going crazy right after. Sure. So I took in all of that just on the descent and then with the plans of then meeting up with you later on, and I was able to grab the rest of the pack and everything else. But so it, that was like one of my biggest eating spots on the entire race mm-hmm. was coming down in that section. Just not when it's really scary at the top when you're descending with everybody. Sure. I did the flat spot and then once I got to the fire road. So it's, yeah, super important to, to space it out like that. Okay, uh, uh, back to how you, uh, during a workout, ingest fluids or gels. Um, you also need to understand that carbohydrate impacts your hydration levels. Uh-huh. So, the, you know, really, if you're looking at using your fluids for hydration, you want to keep the carbohydrate content 3 to 4%, no higher. Uh-huh. Any higher than that, and it starts to become something else. Not as much about hydration, it's about nutrition. Unfortunately, this is a trade you have to make. If you're uh-huh. going to use fluids to kind of hydrate, but mostly nourish, you have to recognize there's going to be a little bit of potential for dehydration there. So you have to combat that with, you know, just, just water, if at all possible. Sometimes it's not, and you just have to accept, I'm going to be a little dehydrated, but sugar is more important right now. That's just how it works. So I'm going to have a six to 8% solution or eight to 12% solution, et cetera, based on what you know, you can tolerate. Right. Yep. Um, as far as gels and carbo fluid, uh, with workouts under 60 minutes, if you're topped off, from, from the night before, didn't do a hard workout. You know, you're getting up, in a, you're in a fasted state. Maybe your liver glycogen is depleted, but you still have plenty of muscle glycogen on, on board. Uh-huh. Don't sweat it. If you're worried about that whole muscle catabolism, five grams of carbohydrate. And we're talking about literally one of those glucose tablets is uh-huh. probably enough to stave off any catabolism that'll take place over 30 minutes, and then maybe another one for the remaining. So 10 grams total over an hour long workout. Uh-huh. Um, and then obviously it has to be quick carbohydrate. Yep. Over 60 minutes, um, carbohydrate ingestion is not only recommended, but it probably becomes necessary. Uh, And in this case, we're talking small amounts frequently. Mm -hmm. So if you know, uh, you've done your, done your, uh, spreadsheet, whatever, and you know, I'm going to take in 20 grams all the way up to 120 grams over the course of each hour and just break that up in 10 to 15 minute feedings, Mm -hmm. do this, do the simple math and make sure you're eating every 10 to 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. any longer than that 15 minutes. And that's when you start to, to risk unnecessary depletion. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if you come into the workout a bit depleted, obviously you need to start this nourishment earlier. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Okay. So 
<clears throat> we've talked uh, a number of times how the, the absorption rates of glucose pretty much tops off at around 60 grams an hour. This is where most athletes fall. But if we couple that with fructose, because of the different transport systems, we can add another 30 grams of pro, uh, fructose, making it about 90 grams of carbohydrate as the high end of things per hour. Uh -huh. Exper experientially, we have noticed with both you guys, you can, you can well exceed that. Uh -huh. So there is new, new, new evidence. Um, and outside I of us, call this, yeah, outside <laughs> of us, I call this from basically two books is the RP diet for endurance by Alex Harrison and various co-authors uh -huh. and the Re Renaissance diet 2.0 from Mike Isratel and co-authors. And these are, uh -huh. these are reputable f folks in the field. Uh -huh. Um, and, and I'm sure they do cite studies and I did start to dig into some of the studies, but when we're talking evidence-based, it doesn't just have to be research from a laboratory. They're looking at hundreds and thousands of athletes that they've worked with over the years. And these are the things they found. Uh -huh. That's about as evidence-based as I need anything to be. Uh -huh. Um, so we used to say it is a two to one ratio of glucose to fructose. And basically you would just run up to that 60 grams of glucose. And if you needed any more than it had to be fructose, mm -hmm. the, the recommendation from these guys is that you start with a one to one ratio regardless. Interesting. For a couple of reasons. One is that the one to one ratio is frequently better tolerated during high intensity work. And it's just better tolerated across athletes. Huh. So if you haven't experimented with 30 grams of fructose, 30 grams of glucose before knowing that you only need 60 grams per hour, mm -hmm. give it a shot. See if it works better for you. I mean, huh. if it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it. But if you know, you are dealing with GI distress, maybe make this a consideration. It's worth trying. What's interesting about this is they've touted absorption rates of 144 grams per hour. That's a lot. That's enormous. I mean, we used to think 90 I and mean, these guys are jumping it up to 144 mm -hmm. and they attribute that to the fact that. Well, let me say their, their quote is convincing evidence has shown that nearly 90% of the population can consume, tolerate, absorb, and burn up to roughly 144 grams per hour of carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. And this is provided that the gluto glucose or the maltodextrin is limited to 70 grams. And then obviously the rest of it's going to have to come from fructose, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and there's something to do with if, if fructose and uh, glucose are combined, there's a co-transport with glucose that allows you to absorb more fructose. So mm -hmm. that, that fructose limitation of 30 grams is not, obviously is not a hard limitation. Interesting. But all this goes, you, you have to recognize that experimentation and habituation are absolutely necessary. Self-knowledge, right. train your gut. Think of the advantage over a long ride, like an Ironman or a lead oh, bill or a gravel ride to have this much oh, more. Man. At we, the end of a race, to, yeah, to that kick it, is, it up. It is a legitimate race? game changer. So we've yeah. covered this before. And in fact, I'm even thinking of like a Strava comment that you got recently, Nate, um, because you were saying that you drank carbs and it helped. Uh, you had more carbs and it helped on the I workout. A, no, huge oatmeal. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah and which helps. Uh, and your workout was two hours, something like that, right? Yep, yeah. two hours sweet spot. <laughs> and I remember somebody saying like, people do workouts that are like days long and they don't need carbs. It's silly to think that you need that. So like there's an old school mindset, I think around carbohydrate and like loading and everything else where people say like, you do that, you take in the carbs and then you don't completely fall apart which AKA bonk. Yeah, you can't over long rides, long events, you cannot keep up with carbohydrate expenditure. You can't take in enough to match what you're, what you're using. It's tough, right? So like a lot of people see that the only reason Unless you're taking carbs would be to avoid a bonk. Whereas what, you know, what research actually has shown is the fact that actually, if you take on more carbohydrate performance improves and so, recovery and recovery, and recovery. so yeah. it's not just We're about avoiding a, a, a pitfall, so to speak, and a cliff that you'll fall off of. Instead, it's improving what you're actually your level of performance the whole way throughout the workout. So that that's just a kind of a shift for some folks. And it lowers the RPE. So if you, you could go into every one of your workouts and instead <clears> of it being like, an eight or a nine, it's now a seven. Yeah, man, it's so much easier to be consistent oh, yeah. because everything like doesn't hurt. You saw you just did antelope, yeah, um, which is a five by ten sweet spot, not yeah. the hardest workout. You did a harder workout a couple days earlier. Yeah, you had recovery time in between, but because you slept less, your RPE went up. Yes, and it and was so much harder. So much harder, right? If you yep. if every workout was just banging your head against the wall, mm -hmm. it's hard to be consistent. You gotta have a really sure. sharp like hard mind, but yep. it's so much easier if you just eat a bunch of carbs. Yeah. Um, and two, some people will say, you know, we're not talking about ketosis. You could be um, a fat adapted athlete and sure. not have to eat. Uh, I don't think your performance would be as good as a carb athlete um, yeah. in a lots and lots of events. There might be some ultra long distance would be better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some people say, but if I do this, then I don't have to eat during the ride, yeah. which is true, but I have, I like to eat during rides. Like, 
And uh, no big for, deal. For, sure. for me, especially pers- a multi hour ride. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't understand what the big deal is. Like people are like, but we I don't have to, I did a, f- that's, that's awful. something that goes with the whole, the, the ketosis approach is that people talk about, they brag about eating once a day and that's a drag that, yeah. that, that bummed me out for the brief period of time. I tried yeah. it. I only got to eat one time a day. I just wasn't hungry. Yeah. yeah. So I either ate in the face of no hunger or I only ate once a day, which is, yeah. I, I feel eating. like it's a negative rather than a positive. At least I, for me. I, I, I like agree. If, if you don't have carbohydrate mm-hmm. on hand and you, for some reason, can't take it in, like, yeah, it'd be really handy to, to have fat adaption, yeah. right? Yeah. That's yeah. one thing. Yeah. So, and if so, you're an ultra but, runner and you're going to be out there for 14 <clears throat> hours, the idea of carbohydrate at some point is not going to be appealing anymore. So it's nice to know that you can survive on and fat, fat metabolism You'll alone. have to have a Sherpa carrying your carbs for you <laughs> for that sort of a thing, right? Because sure. you're carrying so many. But one, one thing that I wanted to say with kind of the matching up of like, with all of this information that we've just discussed and then kind of matching up, should I eat before my workout and just eat more or should I eat normally and then fuel during the workout, how to balance that? I find that I feel better and I at least, you know, I don't have any data for this at all, but I feel like I live a more healthy lifestyle and I just feel better in general when I don't try to fuel my workouts excessively. Like I'm just talking throughout the week, by like eating a ton at lunch because I mm. know that I have something else coming up, but instead sticking to a measured diet and then just making sure I fuel throughout my workouts as well. Mm-hmm. I find that it's personally a little bit easier for me to then optimize my body composition and just feel better in general. Um, it, you know, to, the contrast would be an extreme contrast to be like big workout today. I'm just going to go crazy on the amount of carbohydrates beforehand, rather than just always eating a pretty high carb diet. And then when I go through my workouts, making sure I'm feeling them appropriately. Yeah. So kind of a, is a, at least that's how I, I personally balance it. Yeah. Yep. And the only thing I didn't, didn't cover is just real quickly, Brian, um, limit any of that front loading that you might have to do to inside that 30 minute window. We've talked about it already, but it, it bears repeating his last question. At what point in the workout does taking fuel not help? I.e., the last minutes. This is a good question. Yeah. So mm-hmm. first off, consider how quickly food absorbs. You know, if you're, um, if what if it's five minutes to go, nothing you eat is really going to benefit that. Short of maybe a glucose tablet. And what sort of impact is that actually going to have? Mm-hmm. Um, consider the closing intensity. If if you're going full gas, what are you going to be able to digest? You mm-hmm. might just have to grin and bear it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then consider the whole multi-event strategy. So if you're a triathlete, it's a lot easier to eat on the bike than it is on the run. So during the closing kilometers or miles of a, of a triathlon, maybe you do eat. I mean, that's the race technically isn't over at that point, but mm-hmm. that absolutely will benefit. Well, not absolutely, but will very probably benefit the running segment. If for yeah. no other reason, then it means you don't have to eat as much while you run. Yeah. So that's like within the workout, but then and outside then consider, of it. consider facilitating your recovery. Yeah. So getting a jump start on your, on your recovery process is especially important when it comes to multi-day events. Mm-hmm. The idea there being to stay stocked and then start your recovery nutrition as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And then multiple events in the same day, same idea, stay stocked, but you're probably going to do it with quicker burning carbohydrates, so simpler sources. And then finally, um, recovery nutrition can start as soon as you feel like you can tolerate food. So if you're winding down in a workout, coming to the end of uh, a race and you know you got to race again later that day, or you just want to work out the next day, as soon as you feel like you can tolerate it, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good recommendations. Uh, the plans, a lot of times have back-to-back. So Saturday, Sunday on mid and high volume, back-to-back. <clears throat> yep. That's what I dive at the end. I do do a, a gel because I know sure. it's like, it's like you're starting a recovery shake. You're already the feeling the next yeah. day's workout. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No point in depleting yourself, right? In between yeah, you them. don't have to, I mean, you can get your food over the course of the day or you can start right then. It's mm-hmm. there are you, benefits. You could also though at the end, start with some whole food. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to, totally. you're going to have enough time. If it's 24 hours, if it's the same day, you're going to want to do something simple, but mm-hmm. if it's 24 hours, mm-hmm. you can start, you switch to a banana, save some money um, sure. rather than just gels the whole time. Cause gels get And expensive. recognize you're in a highly absorptive state in terms of glycogen replenishment. That's when it's going to happen most rapidly. So if you need to get it in there quickly, that is a window to emphasize. Yeah. Take it in when you make hay with the sunshine, so to speak. Right. Yeah. If you like this video, subscribe to our channel and let us know with a thumbs up down below. If you didn't like us, give us a thumbs down, but let us know what we could do to improve in the comments. Absolutely. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, you should head over to trainerroad.com. It works. True story. That's true. Nate used to be slow and now he's fast. Sort of fast. Not as fast (laughs) as you. Still fast, Nate.